Hey guys, welcome to another Composer Tools. I'm very excited because today we're going to dive in. I'm going to share five tips that I use for writing and programming percussion inside the computer. I'll go through each of the steps and share an example, programming with it. And then at the end, I'll do a little speed writing and walk you through the process as I try to score something pretty quickly. Now for this video, I'm only gonna be using the new Orchestral Tools Tom Holkenberg Percussion. I'm not only going to show how I've got my Tom Holkenberg Percussion template set up, I'm also gonna share that with you if you're a Logic user and you own Tom Holkenberg Percussion, you can go ahead and just download this template that I've created. It'll load up all of the instruments in folders, nice and neat and clean, as well as color categorized for you. And a big thanks to Orchestra Tools for sponsoring today's video. This drum library is the heart of my sound. This gives you the AAA composer's very own drum collection. The exact same drums you've heard in Mad Max, Fury Road, Zack Snyder's Justice League, and Godzilla vs. Kong. And I'll include a link over to the Tom Holkenberg Percussion Library. First thing below. In most classical music, orchestral music, percussion is like the least important thing. But when it comes to scoring, when it comes to trailers, when it comes to action films, percussion is pretty much king, right up next to brass, in my opinion. So when I got a chance to start working with Tom Holkenberg's percussion uh, a couple days ago, I realized that it gave me an opportunity to rethink the way that I'm scoring with percussion and kind of approach programming, uh, writing in the DAW in a whole new way. So here's five tips for writing with percussion, and I'm going to show you how I've been using these techniques with Tom Holkenberg's percussion. Let's dive in and check it out. Okay, I've got a little percussion uh, part, a very simple part. I've loaded it up. I'm using Tom Holkenberg's percussion, uh, one of the big bass drums, 24 inch, and you can hear it right here. Now, if you haven't seen the first look video and you're not familiar, I'll just explain a couple quick things about this percussion library because there's a couple key things I'm going to be doing with the library to show these examples for tips and techniques. The first thing is that these individual instruments are mapped from lowest velocity to highest. Now, by playing any key here on the keyboard, it's going to always trigger the same velocity. So to create a more realistic groove or drum pattern with this library in particular, you want to vary up your dynamics. And that means that you're either going to be growing a phrase or shrinking a phrase. Um, you're going to be having accents. So for instance, we can move these accents to the front for a syncopated beat. And then instead of just copying and pasting and repeating the same kind of thing, we could vary it up very easily by just moving a couple of notes here and there. Now this will make a huge difference Anytime you're going to have four bars, eight bars, because otherwise we might find ourselves hearing the same thing looping. We'd actually hear those performances kind of looping in a way. Other libraries might use round robins to try to simulate how you're going to be performing in a way that doesn't sound like it's repeating. But the thing that I'm loving about this library is all I have to do is take my same rhythm after I've got a groove I like, and then just move my notes a little bit.
And so just by varying up um, which notes we're actually playing, we're changing our velocities, we're getting a much more realistic performance. Now with other libraries, you might need to go in and uh, tweak your uh, velocity to change the dynamics. With this one, all you gotta do is move your keys. And I'm finding this very liberating and creative from a programming point of view. Uh, I also am loving the way it sounds, just how much depth there is to it. So with this example, all I've done is try to create a groove that sounds pretty consistent, varying our hits, varying our... But another way, great way to utilize percussion, and especially with this kind of programming, is to make it have its own growth and crescendo. So now, because I'm playing from low keys to high keys, we have, should have a nice crescendo here. And you can see how easy it is now to program in that way. So this is kind of a fun groove, and I think that we'll look at another aspect of programming percussion. You've probably heard this a hundred times. Layering your percussion will make it sound huge. Well, that can be the case, but it also is something you want to be very careful with, and you don't want to go too nuts with it. Usually, if you've got a great sounding percussion library, you just have to be careful how you're going to layer it. So for instance, let's mute our bass drum. We're gonna to listen to the same groove that we just created, only with uh, the high surdo here. Now there's a lot of bite in that. So what I might think about is, well, what if I just mute out some of these? So I just have this pattern. Now played that with my bass drum, suddenly I have a, a lot more uh, tightness and high end punching through there. Another way to really think about layering is to do two, three, four layers. Um, I know that a lot of times you can layer two ponds with surdos to get a really neat sound. I think this, let's see, let's listen to this low surdo on its own. So we'll just listen to this two pawn. Okay, so now I have uh, three independent layers. The bass drum doing what I originally programmed. And then some accents with the surdo. And then I added some more accents with the Tupon. So now I have something that I'm really digging. I really love this groove. It has a lot of dimension to it because there's accents with different drums. And all I've done is copy and paste the groove that I like with that rhythm and muted some parts for accents. I found that's a great way to really increase the complexity without making it overwhelming and having everything doing the same thing all the time. Now, another technique that I think is a lot of fun to use is what I call cascading. And that would be to take something like a, a fill and there I've got it played on one drum. But now if I think about the way a drum set would be set up, now it's played on a custom tom with low tuning, it's a 10 inch tom, and then what if I listen to it on the high tom? Or this low 12 inch. Or this high 12 inch. Or this birch low 12 inch. So the idea is that each of these custom toms are going to give us a different sound. So now my idea, what I call cascading, is to take this fill that I've created and go ahead and pass it around across my drum parts. So for example, I'll start with my high toms, we'll give it three beats, three notes, then we'll go to our low tuning of that same drum, give it another three notes, 
we'll go to our high tom of our 12 inch. One, two, three, four, five, six. Delete those. One, two, three. Delete these. Oh, not yet. And delete these. Go to here and we'll remove these three right there. And now, as you can see, I'm starting to get a cascading uh, for the actual drums. Let's take this one, delete the last hits here, and and this one here. So when I look at it as all the MIDI together, it looks exactly the same because it is exactly the same MIDI. All I did now is pass this fill around the toms. So that doesn't just work on concert toms though. This can be used on a number of different exciting programming ways. So let's do the same thing here. I'm going to go ahead and merge all of my groove. I'll move it up to my marching band 8 inch drum. So that's a nice sound. That's going to be great. And what we're going to do is the same thing. We're just going to go all the way down this time. Start with our 8 inch. We'll hit it for 3. Three there. And we'll save these last bits at the end. So now, oh, I got a straggler there. Now I've got the exact same MIDI. All I did was move it across the multiple instruments. So now I've got a new exciting fill. It sounds completely different than that last one because it's played with different instruments. So as you can imagine, this technique can be used in a number of ways. I call it cascading because I'm using a fill going down. You could of course do it exactly the opposite and make your fill go up. And I don't know if I could do that quickly, but I'm gonna go for it here. There we go. It was that easy to go ahead and create a cascading up this time. Taking what we've already created, utilizing this cascading and the rhythm we created with our bass drum, Serto, and Tupan, I now have this. And that sounds pretty cool, but one way that I could make this even more exciting if I was actually going to be repeating this, as we talked about, is to either move instrumentation, which I'm going to randomly do right now, across different bass drums, uh, different tupan, and different toms, and across different bass drums, different surdo, different tupan, and then we'll move this to the tom fill. Now we should have same groove, same feel, passed to different instruments. And that's a pretty cool sound right there. Now one thing I do want to say as a last tip or technique, anytime you're writing for percussion, if you want to get someone's attention, then stop playing. Having a big hit with moments of silence, that can add so much intensity. The ability to stop all that sound and just listen to a little bit of the tails before you get back into something, that is a way to break things down so you can build them back up again and build some excitement for the listener. Now for the next portion of the video, I'm going to try something a little different. I'm going to do a little speed writing. I've got a little percussion piece that I've started, and then I'm going to go ahead and program on the fly and share my thoughts along the way as to how I'm trying to quickly write a piece. Now if you haven't done speed writing, uh, a lot of times speed writing for me is about trying to find really special ideas or trying to find new techniques so that I've got them in my arsenal the next time I have to sit down and crank something out in half an hour 
two hours a day. So if you haven't incorporated speed writing into your practice, especially if you're a beginning composer, then I highly recommend you go ahead and just try to do some speed writing because it'll really beef up your chops. All right, let's dive into this piece and see what happens with it. The rest of the video, I'm gonna basically break down and share a piece that I'm working on. And then I'm gonna finish the piece and go step by step and show you the ways in which I'm thinking of using this library and it's gotten me writing really quickly. All right, let's just dive in and listen to what I got right now. Um, as you can see, my templates divided up. Bass drums are here, certos are here, two pans are here, concert toms are here, tay toms, marching drums, and custom drums. And I'll just highlight everything so you can see some MIDI as we listen to this playback. stop right there. You can see this piece here is not complete, uh, but it is using quite a few of the Tom Holpenberg percussion. Uh, one thing I do love about the library, if you're not familiar with it, is just the ability to play across the range of the keyboard for low dynamics, up to the top for high dynamics. And because of that, it has me thinking very differently about my percussion parts. So, for example, the beginning of this piece starts out with a pretty simple bass drum rhythm. And then from there, we're going to double that, layer it, and create a new dimension to it. And again, now what I'm doing is accenting that rhythm with the one ands here. I could have just repeated that, but instead, uh, changing it up is what gives some contrast to the piece and adds the dynamics. So you can hear from the beginning of starting that one and theme, We've passed that around. The first time, we used a bunch of drums. We used toms, we used uh, cerdo. And the second time, we used a marching band, bass drum, and then a high tom, and then back to a highly tuned marching band drum. So for those accents, I'll just play them on their own. By varying up the accent, we're not just doing the same thing each time. It's adding a new dimension, something interesting for the listener. And also, I'm also using a higher pitch drum as I continue. So that's in a way uh, a level of frequency response that's growing from mid, from low to mid to mid to high. And then continuing with that same rhythm here that we started with. It's the first time we have a lot of forte going on. And it's not a ton of drums. We've only got three different uh, surdos, two surdos and one two pan. But it's nice and strong. It's obviously that it's full, but it's not so full that it's a massive. And the reason being is because it gives us somewhere to go bigger later on. Now jumping into this little fill, just some kind of pop out after we have a moment of silence. Using silence in a percussion part can add a huge amount of contrast, especially when you have a driving rhythm. Uh, just being able to cut and have nothing there, not only does it give you a place to go, but also calls attention to itself. Mm -hmm. 
So I've literally now gone and copied and pasted my beginning uh, rhythm that we've heard throughout the piece and just changed which instruments are playing with it. We used to have the bass playing the rhythm. Now we've got a couple surdos and the tupan, which is pretty standard, I think. I think Tom uses surdo and tupan quite a bit in his writing. And see, we're only doing that three times before we get something new here. Now this is a lot of fun here with these toms. This is the first time I'm using toms in maybe a more traditional way. Going from a high tom to a lower tom to the lowest, well, yeah, the 18 inch. By doing that, I'm getting more of a traditional kind of fill. And now we've got that same rhythm that we had in the beginning and that at 27 through 30, but uh, this time I've gone ahead and moved which instruments are playing with. So for contrast, let's take a little listen to what it sounds like here. And now here. And now here. The other great thing about this library that I will be maybe able to show you here is you can see these percussion parts, how they've evolved. Even though I'm changing instruments, I'm also changing what level the instruments play at. So by playing at this lower dynamics to this higher dynamic, We're able to just quickly move and transpose these pieces. And then on the second time around that I did this, I didn't just, I just literally grabbed and moved my MIDI. So I could do it in a number of ways. Let's just mute and listen to our surdos here. We could have very easily gone same way around here and gone constantly going getting lower and see that is kind of cool that's actually a better part has more interest so i'm going to try to see what we do here we'll move the same way we'll go from our high to our low and then our lowest one so now using our surdo and tupons together Yeah, that has a lot more interest than it did before. And that's without the toms even. And this one's standing out a little bit too much for me. Just move it around a little bit to change dynamics. And now what's really fun is because I have this fill here that I did for the end of the first time through. I just went ahead and moved it over to the um, toms, the tay toms here, and then just removed the first bar. So I got a hit, a little bit of silence. Very kind of traditional drumming pattern there. Now, one thing that Tom talked about when in the video is about these quad toms and about how this uh, library in particular 
these quantoms are <laughs> four different drum sets in the studio in four different corners. So it's it's already kind of mixed in a way. Instead of going in and layering and panning, you already kind of have something going on. So if I only had the toms to work with, I could go ahead and, and see if I could create something with, with just these toms here. So I'm going to go ahead and take our rhythm that we've got here. I'm going to take my accents and give them a little bit of oomph. And then to get it a little bit less loopy, I'm going to go ahead and change up those layers. Now what I have there is something that doesn't sound like a loop anymore. One thing that's great about the library is because you're doing these dynamic layers from the bottom of the keyboard to the top, you're able to just move around your notes, trigger different dynamic layers, and by moving these up, you can hear now that it doesn't sound like it's repeating itself. And there's different character that actually goes on in the performance, which I think adds so much to this. So let's take a step back here. I'm gonna go ahead and see what I've got, where I'm coming from, so we can figure out how we're gonna wrap this piece up. Now we're starting to get something pretty, pretty meaty here using these quad toms. Okay, so we got this tom part right here. Just a little bit of uh, syncopation to it. And I think that might be fun to bring back once we just have the quad toms doing the main rhythm. Right here, perhaps? But instead of just uh, having it do the same thing there, maybe we have it do a little run uh, down those toms. So this is a way, a technique that I've been using. I'll go from that. I'll start at the high tom. I'll go to the low 12 and go to the low 14 for the last ones. And let's go ahead and I'm just going to, you can see right now they all have the same performance, but what I'm going to do is just get rid of the last notes on the first one, the first and last notes on the second one, and all of the first notes on the third one. So you can kind of see the pattern going bum 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 bum. And that's a very easy technique. I took that same fill, moved it across toms, and it sounds very different. Now, what's great about this technique is we can also use it on these tay toms. So let's say we we're gonna do it again somewhere, maybe over here. And now we'll go from the uh, high eight to tom two, 10 inch, tom 13. Actually, let's go lower for these. Let's do the 16 and the 18, and we'll double these here. There we go. So now we'll have this same rhythm, but in a new place. And now we've got a way to make it sound completely different. And we could do this one more time even if we want. We could take the same exact thing and bring it down to our marching drums, like right around in here. And double those low ones and the high. Yeah, now we got a whole different feel. So we're doing the same fill four times, but it should sound differently.
again to get us going a little bit more exciting here instead of just having these quad toms play the same thing. I'm going to go on and take the first one up. Right about there. Move these a little bit. Building my dynamics as I go. And now it will never sound like a loop because the instruments are playing back completely different things after the first two. And hearing it there, I wonder if we can go more extreme. Let's see what's our, what's our loudest. There we go. There's our loudest dynamic right there. If I had the keyboard, it would show me. Well, we missed that guy there. Now we've got something that should grow and build. Now the piece has gotten to a place where we gotta figure out how to wrap it all up. Beginning here. I think this might be a good way to do it here. Just with something right there to give us the same old familiar kind of thing going on, except for we want more intensity with it this time. So instead of just doing a certo there, we're gonna need to really crank this guy up and we need to give him a downbeat. So. Yeah, we grab him. Get it nice and loud there, and then let's find a nice blend between our surdu and our tupan. And I'm going to just literally move the MIDI around until I find something that I think blends well, because I'm just learning the instrument this week. And there we go, I went ahead and threw a little bit of bass drum in there and I think we have a nice solid sound there. And I'm gonna go ahead and grab my hits that I've used throughout and move these guys. There we go, as well as my quad tom hit to try to wrap the whole thing up. And from there, we've got a whole piece. Let's just see what we've created now. I'm not gonna break down writing this part. I'm gonna take a minute, take a break, come back, write with uh, Tom Holkenberg's Brass Library by Orchestral Tools. Now that's used to be called Junkie XL Brass. 
and then I'm just gonna play it for you and we'll see what we've got and maybe what we've learned through the process. Alright, so, is it a winner? Mm, I don't know. Is it a good start to something interesting? Possibly. Did I learn a lot about programming with this library? Absolutely. And I hope that you've gotten something out of today's video. Please comment below if there's something you learned or another tip maybe that you want to share with everyone about writing for percussion. If you're not already, please subscribe to the channel. Like, share it with your friends, and be sure to head back around to Sample Library Review on Fridays for the weekly Deal Compressor Show, where we recap the latest new releases and special offers.